Yes, welcome to Home Studio Q&A for yet another week where I answer your questions about home and mobile recording. My name is Pete and my passion is helping you create, record and release your best music and I do that through tips and tricks and tutorial videos and live streams like this one. So if that's your kind of jam, consider subscribing. Now in this one, I'm answering a whole bunch of questions that I have got from folks during the week and people send me questions via email, they send me questions via Facebook and Instagram and a whole bunch of different places and I thought rather than just answering those questions, I've started this show so that I can answer them for everyone because well, I actually love Q&A shows because sometimes you get to answer questions. You get to hear about questions that you didn't even know that you had and other people asking the questions, you may go, oh, that's really interesting. I've never thought about that or I'm going to try that or that's a question I had, but I didn't know how to phrase it that way. So they're all the reasons why I do this show. So welcome to those that are watching live here on Facebook and YouTube. Good to have you along. And if you are watching on the replay or listening to the podcast, I love you just as much. Feel free to reach out to me. Go to studiolivetoday.com for all the ways to get in touch. We'll jump into the question shortly because we have a heap to get through but my topic of the week and a question I've been getting a lot lately is how do I get into live streaming so live streaming videos so I'm going to do a quick live streaming 101 which is like uh, my three or four minutes uh, on getting started with live streaming so first of all what is live streaming well it's this it's what you're watching right now or if you're watching a replay or listening to a podcast this was recorded live so I stream live to YouTube and to Facebook I use a service called StreamYard, which is what I'm using right now to stream my video and audio out to Facebook and YouTube. But you can really get started just using your smartphone or your tablet and a headset. So it can be as simple as that. If you want to get into live streaming, you can do that. Now, why as a musician or a creator would you want to live stream? <laughs> Apart from the fact that uh, it can be a good cathartic experience and it can get you over your fear of public speaking and, and public broadcasting, as it's done for me. Um, the other reason is that it helps you share real content. It is a quick and easy way to get some messages out there. If you've created video before, you know how long it can take to edit video and to bring audio and video together. Live streaming just gives you an opportunity to hit record, go live, hit stop and then you're done so that can be really good and if you're a musician it's great to be able to share not only your music but a little bit of behind the scenes so if you're out performing a lot of buskers will live stream their busking performance Samantha Edge here uh, in Adelaide uh, a great uh, busker and live performer she does a bunch of live streaming of her busking as well as her sort of home studio concerts which is pretty cool uh, and you can also do a little bit of behind the scenes stuff so you can tell people what's going on. And the platforms you can stream to these days are plentiful. You can stream to Facebook, uh, which is pretty easy and everyone can do that basically. If you go to your smartphone and hit live, you can be live within a few seconds on Facebook. You can do it on YouTube. You do need a thousand subscribers to stream on mobile, but you can stream from your PC or your Mac on YouTube uh, without a thousand subscribers. And Instagram, uh, Twitter, TikTok, like there's so many places you can live stream now. So I thought I'd give you a little bit about the gear that you should consider. So like I said, a smartphone with a headset is what I'd get started with. You can use a Bluetooth headset. You're going to get a bit of latency or lag or delay, which is okay if you're doing it by yourself. But if you're doing it interview style, Bluetooth may be something to avoid. As you get more serious, you can get better quality equipment. So with your smartphone, you can start plugging in mixers and USB interfaces and uh, iOS interfaces. And of course, here on Studio Live today, plenty of videos to help get you started with that. If you're using a Mac or a PC, when you're starting out, a USB microphone is a great thing. You would have seen a lot of people doing live streaming with something like the Blue Yeti, or I like the Samson Meteor. So any blue, uh, sorry, any USB microphone with a headphone jack, you can stream your audio, and you can actually uh, hear as well through uh, through plugging in some headphones to that. Webcam wise, I use the Logitech webcams. You can start with a cheap one. You can use the webcam on your laptop. I use the Logitech 920C922. It's a great option if you want a good quality webcam for your Mac or your PC. But again, like like music, like what I say about music, it's better to start with what you have right now. And everyone's pretty much already got a, a camera built into their smartphone as well as a pair of headphones or headset or something that you can use to get started. Uh, what about the how-to? 
So a few quick tips before we move into the other questions. Less is more. When you're starting out, and you're probably going to say, Pete, you do like half hour and hour long live streams. Yeah, but when I started, I did five and 10 minute live streams because it's very easy to start ranting. It's very easy to just go into a lot of detail and be talking and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, I won't rant about ranting, but you get my drift. Having an outline is really good too. So just hitting record or just hitting live and talking, sometimes you're not going to really make a clear point. So even if you just have three or four dot points of things you want to cover, it could just keep you on track and keep you moving on. As I look at my dot points right here, uh, if you're reading out comments that people are putting on the screen, please read the comment and then respond to it. Have you ever listened to a live stream or watched a live stream where someone's like, oh yeah, great comment that one. Oh yeah, I think that too. And you're like, what are they talking about? Unless you're actually following the comments, you're not going to have a clue. So read the comment, just say, so I've got a comment here from blah, they're asking blah, and here's my response. That works out well. And finally, consider replayability. Because the majority of people that are going to watch your live stream are not watching it live. Like right now, I'm looking here, I've got about 30 folks here watching this live on Facebook and YouTube right now. I know that several hundred of you will watch the replay, will listen to the podcast. So if I'm just spending half an hour talking to the folks who are here live, and I do love the folks who are here live, and I will chat to them throughout this show, then it's not going to have a whole lot of replayability. So you need to make sure that you're considering not just your live audience, but your future replay audience as well. So there you go. There is my rant. There is five minutes in the end, I think, that I spent on uh, on that and we now need to jump into some questions because I've got a heap. I've had a lot of questions this week and I haven't actually looked at a lot of these. I kind of just took a screenshot of them and then threw them up and hoped for the best. So what I'm going to do here now, for those watching the video version, I'm going to share my screen so you can see the questions, but I will read them out for those listening on the audio version as well. So uh, we've got Gangster Potatoes, very cool name by the way. Uh, on my GarageBand iP for iPad, I'll be working on a project for hours and then suddenly it will stop working and delete all my progress. It seems to happen if I make a MIDI track too long. Is there a way to recover lost data or stop this from happening? Uh, so, short answer to this is I've never really come across something like this with MIDI tracks being too long. It seems a bit of a strange one. However, what my advice with this is, is to use, and, and I think I responded to this one already, use version control. So what I do is with GarageBand, every time I make a significant change, I will, well, not every time, but you know, every half an hour or so, you know, you've done some significant work, close out, go back to your My Projects and then reopen. That will save in your changes or better yet, go to your My Projects, duplicate that project, which will create a number two version and then go into that number two version. That way you're only going to lose that little bit. And by the time I get to the end of a project, I've usually got six, seven, eight versions, meaning that if I completely mess up, I can actually go back to a previous version. And if GarageBand crashes or if something bad happens with an audio unit plugin or an interapp audio plugin or something goes wrong, which does happen in GarageBand like it does everywhere, then I've got something to fall back on. So that is my advice for you, gangster potatoes. I hope that helps out. But if anyone else has similar things and has tips, the beauty part of this show is that so it's interactive. So if anyone has any other advice for our friend here, please let us know. Let's jump over to a question from John Gerd. Hello to you, John. Uh, question for next time. So this was on the comments of last week's show. Unfortunately, AUV3 doesn't play nice with voiceover. So can you recommend any inter-app plugins that are still on the App Store? Strange request, I know, but there's a good chance they'll at least be partly accessible. Now we had a similar question or comment last week and it may not have been from you John or maybe from someone else. A lot of folks are using, uh, a lot of folks use iOS uh, because it's quite good if you're visually impaired. It's quite, it has quite good accessibility features on iOS but one of the things that apparently doesn't work well is AUV3 plugins. Because it's opening up a separate app and it's integrating and it's non-standardized it can be really hard to use. So my response to this is I don't use a lot of a uh, I don't use a lot of interapp plugins, but I know a lot of you folks do. So what I'd love you to do is if you have great interapp audio plugins that you use, jump to the comments of this video and put them down there for John. And John hopefully will get some folks who will come and throw some of those down in the comments for you and that will help you out. Let's continue on. Now, in the last week, I've had a bunch of questions along these lines. So this is a question from Justin. It is, do you think that the Lightning to HDMI adapter can have an additional adapter plugged into it so that you can use HDMI and then maybe USB? 
So this question is around the lightning to HDMI adapter that you can connect up your iPad or your iPhone to your HDMI enabled monitor or TV. The problem with this adapter is like the lightning to USB adapter, it only has a lightning port for power. So there's no way to use it and other devices. Now, if you're using a third generation iPad Pro that has USB-C, that is a lot more functional. You can hook it up to your screens, you can hook it up to multiple devices. But the big problem here is that Lightning doesn't have any way to have multiple Lightning sockets. So you can't actually connect up a Lightning to USB or a Lightning to, um, Lightning to HDMI and then connect other devices. Now with USB, you can connect it to a USB hub, which can actually work out. And I haven't tried a lot of the other sort of docking stations and hubs with Lightning, but from what I've heard, they're not super reliable. They don't work very well. But if you have more experience with this, once again, uh, jump into the comments and let us know because maybe there is a way that I'm not thinking of. The other way you can do is to actually use uh, your Mac to actually to uh, use your AirPlay to AirPlay to a Mac, or do what I'm doing right now using an app called Reflector 3, which is actually reflecting from my iPhone directly to my PC monitor, which you can then stream or you can then view as well. You'll get a bit of latency because that's using Bluetooth um, or it's using like a network to do that, but it's better than nothing. So hopefully that helps out. But yeah, I've had a lot of questions about uh, wanting to display on a big screen. So uh, yeah, if you've got advice on that, then let us know. Next question. Um, I've just bought a pair of KL Audio LP6 speakers and a Focusrite Scarlett 2i2 third gen audio interface. Whew. It says in the Focusrite manual that the output on the back supports a quarter inch cable. Does that mean it doesn't support the TRRS cable you're referring to? So this was in response to my video about TS, TRS, TRRS, XLR, all the different cable types and what you need to connect to what. So the short answer to this one is that there's basically two different standards and I'll try to keep this super quick. So there's two different standards of sending audio. There's unbalanced and balanced. So RCA, the little red and white or red, white and yellow that you would have seen with your DVD players and VCRs back in the day and your audio components, they are unbalanced, sending an unbalanced signal, which means slightly more susceptible to noise, slightly lower quality generally. You then have a balanced cable. So a, an unbalanced cable is often called a TS cable because it's tip sleeve. It's only got the two to send the, uh, the audio in the ground. A TRS, tip ring sleeve, has three. So it has the tip, the ring, the sleeve. It's sending two signals and the ground. So that just means that you get two copies of the signal. It does a bunch of voodoo that I can go into in another day. And then you get a better quality signal with less noise. The short answer to this is most high quality interfaces have a TRS balanced output and most high quality audio speakers have a TRS input, a balanced input. So if you have a balanced output and a balanced input, get yourself some TRS cables, hook it up, you'll get the best quality audio. If one or both only has RCA output or input, then you'll need to buy an unbalanced RCA cable or a quarter inch to RCA cable to connect it up. It'll still work, you just won't get as good quality audio. So hopefully that was a quick-ish answer to that question and helps you out if you are looking to connect your gear to your other gear. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, alrighty. Now, I've, I've talked a lot about the Lightning to USB adapter for iPhone and iPad, and I've got a question here from Lay General. Uh, can I transfer documents or, uh, or any files other than photos or videos using a Lightning to USB adapter? And the answer is yes, you can. So pretty much any file that's going to be supported by an app on iOS is going to be able to be transferred. And the beauty part is even if it's not, you can zip it up and still transfer it. So what I tend to do is if I've got a big folder full of files that I want to transfer, I want to back up, I want to send somewhere, put on my iPhone or iPad, uh, I just zip them up on my PC, send them over to my iPhone or iPad, and you can either do that. I actually don't tend to use my Lightning to USB adapter for transferring files a whole lot. What I will tend to do is actually use Audio Share and the Wi-Fi. <clears throat> Excuse me, frog in my throat again today. Uh, the Wi-Fi drive feature on Audio Share is really cool. It lets you actually send audio, video, any file types from your iPhone or iPad to your PC or Mac or from your PC or Mac to your iPhone or iPad. All you need is for them to both be on the same wireless network and to enable that function and you can send them. It's really quick, it's really easy, really convenient. I've got a video about it if you search Pete John's Wi-Fi drive or Pete John's audio share, you should find that one. So that's my technique. 
But I, yeah, it, there's definitely other ways to do it, uh, including using the Lightning to USB adapter. So if that's the way you want to go, go for it. Next question here is from Films Robert Plus. It says, hey, Pete, what's up? I'm recording my guitars uh, in one of my friend's project. He lives abroad. We exchange files, more files related stuff. I'm using GarageBand, Bias FX2 or Amplitude on iPhone, iPad 3, uh, old Mac Pro <laughs> and an iRig 1. And he's talking about the quality of the sounds here on the iRig 1 not being great, especially for high distorted sounds. So, yes, the, the, the question here is using an analog interface. And I don't have one handy, and if you're on the audio version, it won't make sense anyway. Uh, but, yeah, one of the ones that plugs in via your 3.5mm jack on your iPad, that is not going to give you great quality sound. And it does tend to really struggle when you have any sort of feedback, distortion, high-pitched trebly sounds doesn't do a great job. So what is the best digital interface for recording guitar that is going to be compatible across both an iPhone and iPad and a Mac or a PC? So I've got two answers to this and I answered to, uh, to Robert as well. Number one is the iPad Pro IO or if you're just using a guitar, the iPad HD 2. So the, the reason I like the Pro IO is out of the box, it comes with a lightning and a USB cable, so you can connect it up either way. It also has MIDI, uh, and it's really good quality, and you don't need any other cables. You don't need a, a lightning to USB adapter, you don't need a powered USB hub. You plug it, you plug in your mic or your guitar, you play and record, you're on your way. So that's very cool. The other one that I recommend is the Steinberg UR22C or Steinberg UR22 Mark. Two, uh, basically the same device. One's just USB three, one's USB two. They do a great job of recording, and you probably get a slightly cleaner guitar input on those, just because of the quality of the components and the size of the unit. But you don't get the portability, and you do need to use a Lightning to USB three adapter, and you do need to generally have a powered USB hub around if you want to connect up other gear as well. So that is my answer to that. I've got another video I'm working on at the moment, which is basically those two setups. Just shot because a lot. A lot of people come to me and they're like, Pete, you say all these different things, but I just want the simple answer. Just tell me what. Just say, here is a, an option you can go out and buy today. So that is what I want to work on, getting something together. But hopefully that helped you out for the time being. And once again, if anyone else has any other suggestions, drop them in the comments. Again, I'd love to hear from you and love to get your comments. We might take one more pre-roll question here, and then I'll jump into the live chat because I see some folks asking some questions there, and I want to make sure we get to those as well. So let's jump over and take a look at this one. There we go. So from, oh, I think I've, oh, I've already answered this one. I put gangster potatoes in there twice. Nothing worse than having gangster, two lots of gangster potatoes. Um, in fact, I've got a lot of these questions in here twice, or maybe I've just flicked back accidentally on my iPhone. I think I did that. Uh, da -da -da -da. All right, let's just try this one here. We have a question here from Prelude Fuge. <laughs> so this is the most helpful video that I've seen so far regarding the Apple screen recorder function. Uh, does this work for recording somebody's video? Screen plus videos voice only from a website. Thank you. So the question here is, can you use the iPad or iPhone screen record function to record a video playing back on your iPad or iPhone? Now, right up front, I'll put the big warning, warning, copyright infringement, please don't play back people's YouTube videos, screen record them, rip the audio, then re-release that audio, you are gonna get yourself into some serious hot water. That being said, if you want to do something that you have the rights to, or someone says, hey, yeah, you can do that. I've literally used this for my own videos. So when I wanted to clip out a 30 second clip from say one of my live streams and put it on Instagram, I could download the whole video. I could then get it and edit it and put, like, put it into editing program, blah, 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 blah. Or I could just play it on my iPad or my iPhone, hit the screen record function, record the audio and the video, and then edit that clip and then I'm done. Quality is not quite as good, but it's good enough. So the short answer to this one, that prelude fuge, is yes, you absolutely can. Be very careful though. As I always say, uh, yes, I, I won't take responsibility if you're infringing anyone's copyright and yeah, you get yourself into trouble. So no, it's not it's not for ripping off people's beats that they're actually that you should be paying for and then uh, rapping over the top of beats because that's that's not cool. And uh, we're all in this music biz together. Uh, yeah, let's uh, let's show some respect for other people and their creativity. All right, quick coffee. Yes, the coffee break's really great on the audio version, isn't it? Uh, let's jump over to the live chat and say g'day to the folks that we have here. Desolate morning. Sorry I'm late. You're welcome. 
I mean, you're forgiven. <laughs> so uh, let's just come and see if we have any questions. Uh, bah, 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 bah. No. So happy new year from Jim Bird. Happy new year to you too. Um, <laughs> DJ Southball says, not getting notifications on computer. Yeah, so the YouTube notifications aren't always the best uh, in the world uh, uh, telling you when I'm live. I need to get a proper live schedule out there. So, uh, yeah, that would work well. Uh, Danny Elliott's got some tips here. If you use Splice, you can save projects to the cloud for free. It saves versions as well. Huh. There you go. I like that. I'm going to have to investigate that more. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Rads, talking about live streaming, uh, I wanted to do a stream for 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, it went for nearly one and a half hours. I got so carried away. Yeah, it can happen. And that's okay. If, if, you, if you're delivering valuable content and if people are engaging with it, that's totally cool. Uh, but yes, definitely, uh, definitely keep, uh, definitely keep that in mind that you don't want to just be ranting for the sake of ranting. Uh, I'm just coming up here. We do have a question and Mr. Rads has done the right thing here where he's put question in front of his question, <laughs> which helps me find the questions. How do you connect a mixer up to a streaming service? So I basically, if you saw yesterday's stream or if you didn't, I did something very similar yesterday where I actually did that. Basically, any mixer that has USB audio interface capabilities, so we're talking the Samsung MixPad that I used to use, Yamaha MG series are good, uh, the Zoom LiveTrack L8 that I'm using right now, if they have the ability to connect via USB, then you can actually use that as your USB audio interface. And then when you're live streaming, if you go into the YouTube app or you're using OBS or you're using StreamYard, all you need to do is just tell it to use that as your audio input and output, you plug in your microphone, you plug in your headphones, you turn up your dials, and you're off to the races. So yes, whether you're using an audio interface, a mixer, a USB microphone, whatever software you're using, just tell that software to use that as your audio input and output, and you will be golden. You'll be good to go. Uh, so Daniel, it says, do you need to have 1,000 followers on YouTube in order to stream live? Yes, from a mobile you do. Uh, so you need to make sure that you, if, if you want to stream from your desktop or laptop, I believe you can have any number. Uh, but yes, if you want to stream from mobile, you've got to have an established channel with 1,000 subscribers. There's ways around that. There's mobile apps like uh, Streamlabs and others that you can use to stream from your mobile with less than a thousand subscribers, uh, but generally you need a thousand. Uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba um, I think we've covered, I don't think we have a lot of questions from the folks here live. Um, no, we don't. Duh, that's cool. Oh, yes, we do. Sonic Man uh, has one here from earlier in the show. What is your best, what's the best garage band sound instruments from your preference? What are the best? See, I use a lot of garage band sounds that are the stock sounds. So I love the Alchemy synth. I love the piano. The grand piano sound is very, very cool. Um, I use that a lot. I use the guitar amp sims in garage band. They do good jobs for me. And the virtual drummer. So I use the drummer, the virtual drummer on a lot of tracks. I think with a little bit of tweaking, you get a really good sound out of the drummer. In terms of other instruments that I bring in, the Stark Amp Sim, and, and shout out to Patrick over at the Garage Band Guide. He just uh, announced Stark as his iOS app of the year, and I 100% agree. It is my favorite Amp Sim on iOS, on the iPad. Uh, so the Stark Amp Sim I use a lot, and I've just started using, uh, what is the name of it? The, the, the piano, Ravenscroft 275, the piano app which is just an outstanding piano app. So if you're looking to buy some stuff, then you can uh, you can do that. So uh, thank you for the questions from the folks here live. I don't, oh, I have, yes, have we got one more question? Uh, we do. Uh, so I have a question, I help on writing lyrics. I have a song that I've halfway written and having trouble finishing it. This is from Zachary Flo, hello to you. Uh, writing lyrics, yeah, this is a, this is a tough one because my lyrics seem to either go two ways and that's that I write them all out in a day and they all seem to be almost exactly what I need to be. It seems to just flow out of me or exactly what you're saying here. You'll get some written and then you just hit a block and you just can't get it done. Um, my biggest tip for this and something I still use quite often is, and, uh, and I did a video on it recently, it's called speed thinking. And what you do with speed thinking, say you're writing a song about, I don't even know, what would you be writing a song about? Flowers. 
uh, what you do is you take flowers as your root word and then you put 60 seconds on the clock and then you basically do a mental brain dump of every word and phrase you can think about flowers. So you just put the clock down, you say, go. And you go, flowers, uh, bugs, bees, grass, uh, summer, lawn, um, autumn, springtime, uh, flower blooming, petals, uh, delivery, girlfriend, Valentine's Day. So you do that and then at the end of that, you go, oh, actually, a cool concept about that, My, I didn't really realize, I wrote a song about flowers and what I could actually do is bridge that out, make it a metaphor for relationships relationships and giving flowers and whether giving flowers is cool or not cool, whatever. So yeah, you can quickly make connections. So if you're stuck and you're like, what is this next line going to be? Take a step back and go a bit sort of macro instead of micro and just go, what is the topic? What am I trying to say here? Throw down a bunch of words. You'll be really surprised at how quickly that can drive your creativity. Uh, we're getting some love here as well for iSymphonic. Uh, do you like the iSymphonic app, says Gino Therese. Love those strings. Sounds pricey though. Yeah, I've, I do have iSymphonic. I only bought the starter pack and I haven't actually got into it in a big way. 2020, I need to really check out iSymphonic some more. Um, yeah, and uh, Jade Star says, iSymphonic is so damn good. I'm only three packs shy of the whole set. But yes, it isn't It isn't super cheap. It's uh, It's, yeah. It, it's a pretty costly thing. Uh, Dr. Dr. Stuart Backen, what streaming software are you using just now? I'm using StreamYard. So if you go to StreamYard.com, it is a great streaming platform. I have the paid version here, which is $25 a month, but you can do most things with the free version. You get about 40 hours per month free streaming. You can only stream to one platform with the free version, but yeah, if you want to stream to Facebook or YouTube, StreamYard.com, a very cool option for you. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, I'm going to jump back over. How much time do we have? Oh, we, we are almost completely out of time. Let's just see if I have a couple more of these pre-recorded questions that I have that I can actually answer here. Um, da, 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 da. Yeah, let's try. I think this one might be good. We'll pop it up here on the screen. Uh, Jamie Marshall, hello to you, says thanks for making this video. I just wanted to clarify, I've been using GarageBand on my iPhone to record. Basically, so long as I don't use any of the loops, I'm not infringing on any copyright laws. Thanks again, much appreciated. So, yes, um, this is, the, I might finish on this one because this might take me a couple of minutes. So let's, let's talk quickly. I've talked in the past and I've done a heap of videos about copyright, about content ID, about YouTube copyright claims. So let's give you the, the, the 60 second rant on this one. If you're using GarageBand loops or any other loops or samples that are royalty free and are able to be used in commercial work, which all GarageBand loops and sounds are, then you can use them in your projects and you don't have to worry about copyright. You don't have to worry about royalties. You don't have to worry about anything. However, here's the problem. What happens is that people use those free loops, they use those free samples, and they release songs with them. And if they don't change them, so let's just say you grab an Apple loop and the first 12 bars of your song are just one Apple loop repeating. Well, what YouTube, if you release that through someone like a Muse and you put YouTube content ID on it, that if someone else releases a song that uses that same loop, it can be flagged. So even though you don't own the exclusive rights to that loop, the original person who put that song out, it can actually claim the second person's song for using that loop. So what's the way around this? <clears throat> Excuse me. What's the way around this for the people, for someone who is using the loops the second time? It's to basically never have just one loop playing in its original form. And Apple basically say this. They say, as long as you're not re-releasing our actual loops by themselves, you're going to be good to go. If you are going to use them, you can use them within other songs. So do that. Make sure that you're, if you're changing it up, add some effects, add a second loop, add an extra bit of bass, add an extra bit of a beat to there. Change things up to make it sound different and you'll be fine. If you do then get a copyright claim, if you are using loops that are royalty free that you do have the rights to use, there is the dispute process. And everyone I know that's gone through the dispute process, yes, it's a pain. Yes, it takes a couple of weeks. But if you put the dispute process in, you say, this was a GarageBand loop, it's royalty free, I have the right to use it, then it is approved and you don't get that claim anymore. Sadly, some people have taken this on and have gone, I'm going to go out there and put out a whole bunch of music and put YouTube content ID on and try and 
just spoil people's fun and ruin it for other people. So don't be like that, please. If you're planning to, <laughs> don't, just don't do it. Just be creative, make your own stuff. So yeah, you can avoid that by just making your own beats and making sure that if you're using loops, don't just have a single loop playing at one time. You'll notice even in my tutorial videos, I don't do that. I've always got three or four different tracks playing, even if I just wanted to showcase one loop. Because if, I, if a new pack comes out and I just start playing the loops in that pack and someone else has used them in, in a song, then it's going to flag me for copyright ID. So there you go. Alrighty, that is going to do it for the show. I hope you enjoyed this and got some value out of it and had some of your questions asked. If you have other questions, please jump down to the comments down below. That will be a good place to ask them. And I'm always down there hanging out as well as a bunch of the other great people here in the Studio Live Today community. We will be happy to answer your questions there. You can head over to studiolivetoday.com and find the ways to follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, everywhere, LinkedIn, I don't care. Plenty of places to follow me over at studiolivetoday.com. Join the mailing list. Keep up with things over there. If you got some value out of this one and you're watching the video version, hit the like button. If you're listening on the podcast, subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast place. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you for all your questions and all your support. And I'll see you next time.